So yeah, so Animal Health Australia is a not-for-profit organisation and we've got funding members from government and industry. So we work with both of both of those to help achieve um, positive outcomes in the animal health space. We manage lots of different national animal health programs, um, including Farm Biosecurity, which is a really helpful website. If you haven't had a look at it, I highly suggest you do. There's heaps of handy resources available on there. Um, we also have a few other projects such as sheep specific projects like the National Sheep Health Monitoring Project, which is where um, specific abattoirs collect data on sheep health conditions that they note while sheep are being processed. And if it, this information is all made available back to the person who's um, put the sheep through the abattoir. So you're able to find out about diseases that you might not necessarily be able to see from the outside of the sheep. Um, we also have a project called the National Sheep Industry Biosecurity Strategy, which has helped us fund um, this workshop that we're providing for you all today. And we also do lots of work in extension and training. So what is this big scary word that says that is biosecurity? It is any activity that we can do to prevent the entry or spread of pests and diseases. So it's not big, it's not scary, it's not just for people that um, commercially produce livestock or fruit and veg, it's for everyone. Um, risks for the spread of pests and disease come from everywhere and mainly from moving livestock, so disease spread from sheep being in contact with other sheep or in contact with contaminated material. Um, so um, Yoni's disease, for example, can survive in mud in your boots for at least a year. Um, and that is something that's prevalent in our area. So it's very got to be mindful of things like that. Um, pest animals and wildlife can also transmit um, diseases and parasites to your sheep. Um, feed and water are also common points of contamination. Um, from weed seeds and that can, you know, find their way through feed and um, float across through water. Um, and also visitors being another big point where um, vehicles or people entering your property and going through your paddocks um, can also bring in weed seeds and um, other nasties. Um, so one of the first things that you really should consider when um, well, before you even get um, any sheep, is to start planning out your property. So I've got a little map here of, um, of my property and I've um, been working, I've spent too much time working on this. Um, it's really um, important to sort of map out where all your fences are, where future fences are that you want to add. So a lot of these um, yellow lines in the middle are additional fences that I want to pop in to divide my paddocks up for rotational grazing. So rotational grazing is a really handy tool to help manage worm burdens in your sheep um, as uh, worm eggs are passed through feces when sheep are constantly grazing on paddocks um, with their own feces mixed all through it. That's where they're going to keep ingesting worm eggs. Um, and um, it's also really important to plan out if you want to breed your sheep, um, it's important to have a paddock dedicated for your ram that's away from your ewes most of the year when he doesn't need to be in there. And it's also important to have a safe paddock for your lambs. So when you wean your lambs, you need a paddock that's going to have as minimal worm burden as possible, as that's when they're going to be the most vulnerable. Um, during the, the stress of weaning. Um, so for managing biosecurity risks, it's really important to know where your risks are coming from. And so for me, I've identified risks all along my boundary where I back onto the railway. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of like blackberry bushes and weeds come from the railway. And we also have a lot of wildlife that, um, that come through from there as well. So that's a point where we have to um, keep an eye on our fences for damage, as well as um, keep an eye out for, for spot spraying and digging up weeds that come in. Um, and also the front gate. Um, we've only got one entry point into my property, so any entry point where someone can 
drive in um, should be a risk point and something that you need to keep an eye on. Um, when you're bringing in new stock or if you have um, any sick stock, you need to have a quarantine area. So for me, this is going to be up near the house, um, but I'll talk a, bit, a little bit more about quarantine areas later. Um, you need to identify where you can store your feed um, out of the weather and away from vermin um, and things like that. And then um, using a sort of traffic light system, um, sort of identify areas on your property where, um, where you're okay with visitors being. So for me, this green area is up the driveway and all around the house. I know visitors are going to be there. So um, I try and make that as safe an area as possible. And I don't let my sheep go in that area. And then um, continuing on with this traffic light system, have sort of an area where, um, you know, a vet needs to access or you've got power lines. So you know that council or whoever is going to need access. So identify these areas as well. Um, and then red areas, these are areas that people really have, have no need to be. So throughout all the paddocks, there's, there's no services out there. There's, there's nothing that people need to do in those areas of your paddock. So really just try your hardest not to have anyone go in there to reduce that biosecurity risk. Um, and, it's, and I've got a note here too about stray stock. Um, it's really important to maintain those boundary fences so you don't have any of your sheep going walk about onto your neighbor's property or sheep or livestock into yours, as this is gonna be um, a big risk for bringing in pathogens. All right, visitors. Um, so if you've got lots of friends that um, live in Canberra or live in the burbs that love to come out and visit your property, it's really important that if they want to go and pat your sheep, they wash their hands and clean their boots. Even if they haven't come from anywhere where they can bring um, sheep specific diseases onto your property, they can potentially take something from your property to somewhere, somewhere else, or they can also bring in um, any weed seeds that they've um, collected through their, their trips. Um, so if you have visitors coming from other properties with livestock, it's even more important to make sure that if they come onto your property, they have um, clean boots and clean hands. And it's also a good idea to just to keep track of um, people when they're visiting. So for me, I, I like to um, have just in my, in my regular work calendar, I just make a note whenever I have any visitors coming to the property. That way I can plan for it. I know when they're coming, so I don't forget about it. Um, and it's also a good way just to keep track. Um, and yeah, just to emphasize, if they don't need to be in the paddock, don't let them. Um, and for having a, turn in, it's a simple, uh, with some bleach and a scrubby brush, it's really not very difficult and it's really easy to um, supply for any visitors that come to your property. Um, so I mentioned before about having a quarantine area on your paddock. Um, this is really important for your herd um, to maintain health and to keep out um, pests and diseases as best you can. Um, if possible, a quarantine area should not share a fence with any other paddocks on your property, especially if they have other livestock in them. So having using double fencing um, can be really helpful with that. Um, and for your quarantine areas, you're going to use them whenever you buy in new animals, whenever you have uh, livestock coming back, if you've had them on adjustment or if you've taken them to a show, um, every time they should go in your quarantine pen for at least 21 days. So the 21 day period um, allows for passage of any weed seeds that the animals might have eaten or collected. Um, and also allows for visible signs of many diseases to show, although there are also um, a number of diseases that will not show within 21 days. So if you're concerned about these, um, you should isolate for a longer period if you can, 
or chat to your vet um, for some advice if you're a bit concerned that the sheep might have come from somewhere that they might have foot rot, for example. Sometimes that can take a while to sign it to show up. Um, so sheep yards. If you, if you have sheep and you don't have sheep yards, you've got to get them. They're not expensive. They're really easy to set up and they're absolutely essential. If you need to isolate an injured sheep, um, if you are getting a vet to come out to look at your sheep, when you're drenching or vaccinating, you've got to have a good set of yards to help you do that. Um, it's much easier on you and much less stress on your sheep. So yes, yeah, so the positioning of your yards is also important. Um, if you can, it's really great to have your yards central to all of your paddocks so that if, um, if you need to get your sheep up into the yards, you don't have to drive them from one paddock to another paddock to another paddock to get them in there and to potentially have them run in every direction. Um, so for me, um, I've definitely got my yards in a central spot. I don't have a useful dog or a bike to chase my, to chase my sheep and get them into the yards when I need to. Um, so I just get out the good old bucket of um, sheep pellets and give it a shake and they all come running. So um, it's also quite handy to, to train your sheep to do that if you don't have dogs or a bike. And um, it's just, yeah, super easy. Um, and you can do it at any time. If you've got some, you know, a spare 10 minutes, get some feed out, encourage your sheep to go out to the yards, give them some feed and then just leave them be um, and let them wander out in their own time. With having smaller numbers of sheep, um, a lot of us will have sheep that are really quiet and are like pets. Um, and this can actually be um, really helpful with getting them up into the yards, but can also be very difficult in getting them into the race because if a pet sheep doesn't want to go somewhere, it can be quite difficult to make them go there. Um, so just something to keep in mind. So that's why doing the training and getting them through the yards into the race um, can be quite handy because if you need to do it in an emergency, then you know that you can. Um, and for sheep that are a bit more flighty, it's good to know a little bit about flight zones. So generally speaking, um, the shoulder of a sheep is sort of your pivot point. If you're in front of their shoulder, they'll go backwards. And if you're behind the shoulder, they'll generally move forwards. Uh, and sorry, on that one too, um, if you like um, doing a bit of extra research, I recommend having a look up Temple Grandin and the work that she's done through Google. Um, she has done a lot of work that sort of revolutionized the way that yards are set up. Um, she's done a lot of work mainly with cattle, but it's all applicable um, about how yards should be designed for ease of use. Um, so for example, these yards that we have here, um, the, the sharp corner in that small yard just before the race is something that you'd really want to avoid. Ideally, you'd have a rounded corner there because a sheep can get itself trapped in the corner and panic and um, injure itself. So avoiding sharp corners um, is ideal. And yeah, the work of Temple Grandin goes through that type of stuff. I would recommend looking her up. Um, so for if you're wanting to buy sheep, at the very minimum, you need to have a property identification code. Um, so this is really quick and easy to get. Um, just jump online through local land services um, and you can register to get one. Um, even if you only have one pet sheep, you need to have a property identification code. And this is just to help in the event that um, an emergency animal disease were to occur, for example. This way, it's all on a database and the authorities know who to contact that has sheep in the at-risk area to, to let them know and keep you informed about what's happening. So having a peek is really important. Um, and if you plan on selling sheep, you need to register for the Livestock Production Assurance Scheme. And this will give you access to a national vendor declaration. And this is a legal document that um, there are species specific versions. So there is a sheep specific NVD. Um, and this paperwork includes details of your property and your pick. 
um, and a description of the animals that you're selling, where they're going to and when they're going to be moved. Um, and also notes any withholding periods that the sheep are under. Um, so this, this is a must for moving sheep. And then movements of sheep also must be recorded in the National Livestock Identification System, which is that key program that helps to track the movements of our livestock. So that should um, a disease be picked up, then we are able to trace everywhere that animal has been and every animal that animal has been in contact with, even if they've gone in another direction. Um, so this is really important for, for national biosecurity, not just for the safety of your own sheep. Um, and we also highly recommend that um, when you're buying sheep or if you're selling sheep, that you ask for or provide a sheep health declaration. And this just includes a bit extra information about the health of the sheep, um, including foot rot, which um, can be quite nasty and is quite contagious. We've also got um, life, uh, life, lice, um, ovine brucellosis and Yoni's disease, um, and a few other bits of information like that that are important to consider. Um, but if you, if you do find the process of going through all this paperwork quite overwhelming, you can choose to sell your sheep through an agent and um, they're, they're generally pretty helpful and can help you complete all of this paperwork um, and show you sort of how to, how to go about it. Um, there's also heaps of information and how-to guides available online um, to show you how to fill in the paperwork. And my last point here, don't buy sheep off Facebook. Sheep are, ev livestock animals are everywhere on Facebook, everywhere online, don't do it. There's so much risk. There are so many scams that go around. So many people try and sell sheep without this paperwork. So you can un unknowingly bring in all sorts of diseases onto your property, don't do it. If you find that there is no other way and you you, you really have to buy that sheep that's on Facebook, make sure you ask for an NVD and a sheep health declaration. If they won't provide it, don't buy them. Contact your local breeders, go through sale yards, contact your local agent. They will help you buy sheep in a safe way. Water is a, another area that you need to be aware of um, to keep clean. Um, for your animals is it can, again, spread um, pests and diseases. So if you can, any rivers or creeks that you have, fence them off from your, animal, from your sheep so they can't access the water. Um, same as dams, if you can fence off your dams from your sheep and use water troughs instead, this is much more ideal. Um, you know, sheep, sheep will go in the water, they'll poop in the water, they'll wee in the water, and then they'll drink it. Um, so if you can, fence off your dams. Um, if running troughs is, is a big um, and can be a costly exercise. So if, if you can't quite run troughs yet, you can fence off um, most of your dam and just provide a single narrow entry point into your dam for livestock to access to drink. And you can then gravel um, these areas so sheep uh, are unlikely to get stuck, but it is still good, especially in hot weather, to check your dams as often as you can to make sure that sheep haven't gotten stuck in there. And it's also good to monitor your dams um, and other water sources for contaminants, um, which you know you might be able to see some on the surface or um, particularly weed seeds. Feed's probably not something that we would be using at the moment, at least, um, as we've been very lucky to have lots of rain and lots of grass this season. Um, so buying in hay and feeding hay is sort of one of the major ways of bringing in weed seeds to your property. Um, so if you can, when you do buy feed, check the feed for weed seeds. Um, you might be able to have a look at the paddock that the hay was cut from and you can see if, if there's been um, 
if it looks weedy. Um, but when you do feed, um, feed in the same area all the time um, and feed off the ground. Um, so this, this will help sort of prevent your sheep walking through the feed um, and walking feces or through the feed and contaminating it. Um, and it's also important to store your feed out of the weather and away from vermin, which can also contaminate your feed and um, result in mold and other issues. So if, if you're unsure about what to feed your sheep, if um, they're looking a bit skinny, if, um, if you're wanting to provide additional supplementation because you're not sure they're getting enough out of your grass, um, I'd highly recommend having a chat to your vet and um, condition scoring can also help with that to make sure that your sheep are getting their nutritional requirements. So you shouldn't see the size of the sheep sort of concaved in. They should just be nice and rounded while still being able to walk without um, being too overweight, which we seem to have a problem with at the moment. Too much grass and not enough exercise. Pest animals, you might have, um, some of you might have been a part of the um, recent webinars that were on about wildlife cameras and how to use them, um, as well as the um, ones about trapping. Um, so this, this picture here I actually got off our trail cam that we have down in the bottom of our paddock. Uh, we never seem to see deer, but they always seem to pop up in front of the camera. So it is, it is good to know if you can borrow a camera or if you have a camera, it will help you find out what you've got, even if you haven't seen them. So in, in this general area, there's plenty of rabbits and foxes and deer pigs. Um, we've also had some recent webinars about minor birds and starlings. Um, so you can get traps for those as well. And of course, um, rats and mice, which seem to be having a great time at the moment, although now it's getting colder. Hopefully they'll start slowing down. And um, overabundant natives as well can also pose a biosecurity risk to your sheep. Um, so all of these animals can contaminate any feed that you have and will also compete with your sheep for your pasture. Um, they can also contaminate your dams and other water sources, which is why it's really good to have troughs as they're less likely to go up to a trough. And um, these animals can also spread diseases and parasites to your sheep and damage your fences, which can lead to your animals getting out or others getting in. So um, it's really important to help control pests. And in doing so, um, it's really good idea to develop a plan with your neighbors, because if you're controlling rabbits, for example, on your property, but your neighbor isn't, um, your efforts are not going to be very effective. But if you can get all of your neighbors involved in a little bit of a program to control pests together, um, you'll find that you have much more success in doing that. And there is a website for feral scan. So this, um, you can use this website to report pests that you find on your property. It just helps sort of gather data about um, populations and help um, develop sort of control programs. Um, so weeds is another thing that um, we're probably all quite familiar with at the moment, given the um, all the recent rain and having lots of weeds pop up, especially Patterson's Curse um, back in, in summer and um, lots of thistles around. Um, and this yellow one here is um, St. John's Wort. Weed seeds can come onto your property in many numbers of ways, um, mainly through the wind, through vehicles, visitors, through feed, um, through animals that you're bringing onto your property, uh, rivers and creeks that flow through your property. Um, so it's, it's almost like fighting a losing battle sometimes, but it is really important to get on top of your weeds. And there's lots of ways to help do that. So by planting hedgerows on your property, you can, um, it, that can help block out weed seeds that um, come in through the wind, especially if you have your hedgerows um, in a direction that's normally upwind for your property they can actually be quite effective. Um, and, you know, spot spraying, um, hand pulling, 
strategic grazing, there's lots of weeds that are safe for livestock to eat in small amounts. Um, but please do make sure you know which, which ones are safe and which ones are not. Um, so yeah, strategic grazing can help control some weeds. And um, controlling weeds is also about being a good neighbor. So by controlling weeds on your property, the next property downwind from you is not gonna have a, as big of an issue and their weed control is gonna be easier. All right, access to sheep chemicals. Um, so this, this is another big one and another one that's important to keep track of. Unfortunately, vaccines and drenches, the smallest amount you can get are about a hundred doses. And um, these products often, the shelf life of these products, once you've opened them, are often shorter than the next time you're going to need to use them. So for me, I've got 16 sheep. I would get 16 doses out of a vaccine and then have to throw it in the bin. Um, so you, oh, there's a lot of waste, unfortunately, um, in doing it like that. But if, if you don't want to waste vaccine and drench, which I, I recommend that you don't, um, the only way you can get smaller amounts of these is through a vet. So a vet legally is the only one that is able to draw up and give you smaller amounts of vaccines and drenches. So I'm not sure, Peter or Penny, if, if you want to talk a little bit more about that and what you recommend as, as the main sort of vaccine and drench process for the area. Um. If, if you want, I'll just quickly go through the actual yeah, programs that we use for vaccines and drenches, if you like. Um, for vaccinating, we recommend as lambs that, we, that you um, give them their first vaccine at about four to six weeks of age. And usually you mark them at the same time. So that's uh, do their, their tails and um, testicles at the same time. And then about four to six weeks after that, you give them their second vaccine. So that's the, the general sort of six in one uh, type vaccines. Um, I noticed a question there about vitamin B12. You can also get vaccines with vitamin B12 in them, and that can be, you know, and, and then you can use that in, in the vaccination, which is which is quite easy. Um, and then after that, they just need to be vaccinated once every year, once every 12 months, okay? Um, and we normally recommend that uh, in terms of when you vaccinate, you vaccinate you use just before they lamb, so about four, four to six weeks before they lamb, so that that improves their... Um, you know, their colostrum has lots of um, antibodies in it. So that's, that's in terms of vaccination, uh, pretty simple. There's also another vaccine called um, Gudair, which covers for ovine yoni's disease, which uh, Ash mentioned before. Um, that should be done in lambs before they're um, are really around 16 weeks of age. Um, and again, that's something that we can help with because that one, is, is a little bit dangerous. Like if you accidentally inject yourself with that, it can be quite severe. So, so that's something that we actually have an annual program for that we provide to small farmers. We go around and, and actually vaccinate with that one for everyone. Um, and so we can provide that for, you know, for your lambs when they're, when they're young. When it comes to worming, so drenches, uh, that's a little bit different. And that's sort of based on your area and what's happening at the time, depending on the mm -hmm. rainfall and, and those sorts of things. So we normally recommend a drench somewhere in um, sort of springtime and then a couple in uh, summer, depending on what's happening. If it's, if it's wet, definitely at least two drenches over the summer period. Um, if it's very, very dry, then you can probably get away with just one drench. And then another one sort of in uh, autumn time as well, just to cover there. And, and the, the important thing with that is that you can't use the same drench all the time. So again, like Ash was saying before, you buy, you know, um, a big bottle of, of drench and then you only use it once and then really you, you pretty much have to throw it out. So again, we can help with that and help you um, strategically drench. And you can base that on doing um, fecal egg counts, what they call fecal egg counts. So you can actually take some feces, go to your rural, um, rural store and they'll actually be able to send those feces off for you and find out what's there, like if you actually need to drench or not. And then what you can do is you, if, if you do need to drench, you can drench and then you can actually get a, do, do another sample uh, 10 to 14 days after you've drenched to work out if that drench is actually working and killing the worm, worms for you. So that's, that's really good. So um, that's, that's the basics anyway. Um, I won't go into it in great, 
in much more detail. Um, I think we can have a good chat about that when you come out for your field day, though. Mm. Ash, over to you, thanks. Thanks, Peter. And um, just to add on what Peter said, um, if you do go your own way and get your own drench and vaccinations, um, just make sure that you um, you store it correctly as per the label um, and you keep all of your equipment really clean. Um, if you do share vaccine and drench with others, we highly recommend that you have your own drench gun and your own needles and you keep all of your equipment sterilised um, so that you don't share any of this with your neighbours or with who you're sharing with. Um, and if you want to do a little bit more looking into it, the Worm Boss and the Paraboss websites have a lot of really great information um, and they do have some sort of regional specific information to help, um, to help sort of guide your decision making. Um, but as Peter said before, it is important that you um, discuss your drench routine with your vet or with local land services as using the same drench can build up resistance. And um, if you are going through fecal egg counts and getting the egg count as well as getting the, um, the worms typed, so you know what type of worms are in your feces, then you can get the, um, the correct drench for the, for the worms that you have. Um, so I do highly recommend getting fecal egg counts done. They're not that expensive. Um, Peter? Ash, yeah, sorry, I just saw a question there from Steph, Stephanie Helm about um, drenching pregnant ewes. And it is actually safe to uh, drench pregnant ewes. Um, just check the label, make sure that the drench that you're using is safe for ewes, you know. Um, I, I think most of them are. The, the, the biggest thing though, Steph, is when, when you're handling pregnant ewes, you've got to be very, very careful, particularly when they're late pregnant, you know, or, or well, actually very early pregnant or very late pregnant. You've got to be very careful that they don't get stressed because if they get stressed or you, you know, if they get pushed around too much, then they can actually abort and lose the, lose the um, lamb. So just be careful of that. But apart from that, drenching is, is usually safe in pregnant ewes. Thanks, Peter. Well, that pretty well concludes sort of the, the basic rundown of farm biosecurity and the, the parts that you need to be aware of. Um, so it's not difficult. It's not expensive. It's not scary. Um, it's just a matter of controlling weeds, restricting access on your property, making sure you have an effective quarantine process for bringing in new sheep. Um, vaccinating and drenching accordingly. Um, another thing I forgot to mention is when drenching and vaccinating, it's very important to keep accurate records of what you have used on which sheep and when. Um, so if you plan on selling the sheep, if you plan on having the sheep for consumption, that you don't sort of um, go into any withholding periods, just to be sure of that. And if you're selling, you need to make the buyer aware of anything that might be in their system. Start up at the top here and I'll hand it over to you, Peter and Penny. Thanks, Ash. All right. Um, so Jenny, are you happy for us just to go through these questions and just, just answer yep. them one by one? Yep, mm. sounds good. All right, so the first question was about um, carcass disposal. And so if an animal has died or been butchered and you know, obviously there's offal left over, um, you know, is there, is the only reason that they need to be buried according to the guidelines based on infection risk? Well, that's one part of it, but um, I guess so. So if, if you're having the animal slaughtered and butchered for your own meat um, and it's nice and healthy, then there shouldn't be any risk of infection. Um, but it, it, I guess if you had a, a, an animal that died unexpectedly and you don't know why, then there is a potential you know, infection risk there. But the other really big um, or the other important part of this is that they need to be buried according to the guidelines, quite deep so that um, feral animals don't come in and um, go for the carcass because, yeah, just, just leaving carcasses around will actually attract feral pigs and foxes and all those sorts of things. And, and that just attracts, you know, um, feral unwanted pests to your property. And they can be um, a source of 
disease risk, as, as Ash mentioned, you know, they can spread the disease around by moving from property to property. And of course, you know, foxes are dangerous for lambs and all those sorts of things. So there's a couple of different aspects to that, really. Does that help answer your question, Mara? Is that right? Yeah. Alrighty, I'll keep on moving then. Um, does a U lambing break the umbilical cord? Yeah, in most cases that does. It just happens naturally. Um, as the lamb falls down onto the ground, the, the um, cord will break um, and you don't have to do anything. So that's quite normal. Um, if it didn't, you could, you could you can actually just you know pull it apart with your hands, but um, normally it will happen naturally. Is that okay, Linda? Any other questions that you had there or is that answer yeah, your question? All good, okay. Um, Jenny, so your question about vitamin B12, when and what dose for sheep? Did you wanna field that one? Oh, okay, <laughs> you, you just did the read. Um, if you have a deficiency, especially if you've got a deficiency in cobalt, because cobalt comes from the soil and the plants, and that's what animals use to convert to B12. So if you have a deficiency, um, yes, you can get vitamin B12 injectable, for example. It's available online, easy to get. Just follow the recommended Dose rate, it can be two milligrams or more, depending, but they just follow the dose rate for it. Uh, we tend to use it um, in the younger lambs. In the first dose the lambs get, we often use as a combined vaccine that contains B12 in it, and we find that works really well. It does tend to give them a bit of a boost, and we find that's really good on our place because we do have much lighter pasture, lighter grasses and that sort of thing. So we found over the years that that's um, our preferred management for that. And of course, you know, when you were buying um, lots of vaccine at the same time, what we'll do is we'll vaccinate the use with it as well. So signs to look for if there is a deficiency, again, uh, blood test or for the sheep themselves is best, or you can actually do um, a soil test as well, and that will pick up any deficiencies that you might have. Again, you know, sheep that are ill thrifty, not doing well, weight loss, inappetence. But again, as you'll see, those signs could apply to a lot of um, other diseases, hence why I recommend doing testing before you automatically think that you've got a deficiency. Or you can do what we do and just um, use a vaccine that has B12 in it. Or you've even got B12, that they can come in some um, drenches as well. So you're not going to do any harm by including it in your management regime whatsoever. So deficiency or not, there's no harm in um, administering it when you want to. Typically, if you give an injection, it lasts for three to four months. So no need to redo it regularly. So and also B12 is not an expensive uh, injection by any stretch of the imagination either. So well and truly economical if you want to give it separately. Um, in terms of biosecurity, how do you get your <laughs> neighbour to do the right thing to support your biosecurity regime? Um, I don't <laughs> Good know, luck. <laughs> it, I mean, actually, one, one thing that you did mention before, Ash, was, you know, good fences make good, good, good neighbours. Yeah. So that's really important, fencing. But Ash, anything else you want to add? Um, I would probably only add if you can sort of actively do sort of biosecurity practices on your property um, and, you know, try and if you have a good relationship with your neighbours, just, you know, have, have a discussion with them and say, hey, I did this thing the other day. Are you doing that as well? Um, or can I help you do that? Um, unfortunately, you can't make people do anything they don't want to do. So all you, all you can do is try and do the best you can for your property. So if you're protecting your neighbours, then hopefully they'll um, pay that back. Thank you. All right, next question there from Christine was about pink eye. Just wondering how pink eye travels around. Um, it's a bacterial infection and it actually travels with flies um, and in the dust and that sort of thing. So, on the wind. Um, and on the wind. So mm -hmm. um, you, your sheep don't have to come in contact with other sheep. Um, it can be travel, it can travel quite long distances um, with the flies. So, um, not much you could do about it, but if you do pick it up, definitely um, go to your vet and get some treatment and it'll clear it up pretty quickly. Um, 
are there ideas for how to do foot baths for visitors that are slippery to stand in? Yeah, I'm not really sure if I've got any great ideas there. Um, um, just shallow. Yeah, Ash? yeah, you can get these um, big, um, like it's like a giant sponge um, that you put sort of, you put the sponge in a bucket and you put your chemical in there. Um, I have seen them used around. So that way you're kind of standing on a sponge and you're not standing on a slippery bucket. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Next question from Christine was, must the quarantine area only be used when animals come into the quarantine area? If you aren't using that area as a quarantine area for a while, could it be grazed to keep pasture down, etc.? How long between using that area as a quarantine yeah. area and regular grazing? Um, it's a good question. We, we at our place, we actually have our quarantine area at the front of our pro property so that um, sheep can, can go there and we don't normally have our sheep out there. But look, uh, you know, I mean, the thing is that if, if sheep bring in um, worm egg, you know, worms that have that are very resistant, um, they'll hang around in the, the pasture for a very long time. So your sheep will pretty much always be at risk from that. So um, it is really good if you can have an area that um, is pretty much quarantined and you don't have other animals, like you don't have your animals on there otherwise. Um, Ash, did you want to add anything to that? Um. The only thing I could possibly think of is if your quarantine area is um, a dirt paddock and you're yeah. just feeding in it, um, if you regularly clean it, um, then you could use it for other purposes. So if your your handling yards is your quarantine area, um, I guess then, then you kind of have to mix the two, but just try and leave as much time between having animals quarantine in there and using them. But if there's nothing to graze in there, you're going to reduce that risk of, of worm eggs at least. Yeah. Penny, did you, sorry, you were going no. to say? Uh, the other thing is you could think about rotational grazing, for example, you know, you could put horses in there because then they're, they're not going to be susceptible to anything that the um, sheep diseases and pests. Um, sometimes you might be able to put cattle in there as well. But generally, if you choose a species like, you know, horse or that's probably the safest, one of the safest ones. Pigs are also fairly safe as well. So you could think about um, chickens is another way you could uh, use it to manage that area as well. But just some thoughts there. All right. Next question was, when you say avoiding online purchases, does this include Auctions Plus? And I think Jenny replied Jenny, by yeah. saying that um, Auctions mm -hmm. Plus requires use of an agent by seller, so you can expect proper processes to be followed. I think that sounds that's pretty logical. It, Ash, did you have any other thing you want to add? No, that's right. Yeah, Auctions Plus is quite good. It's it's a dedicated um, mm -hmm. mode for buying and selling animals, so it's it's yeah, it's quite good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another question there from Christine about after the webinar, could you please list what the sheep health declaration covers? Um, we can actually provide a, a template of that, I guess, Ash, to everyone, because it basically covers those four things that you mentioned, um, lice, foot rot, ovine brucellosis, and uh, ovine yoni's disease. They're the four main things that they cover, but um, we could probably provide a template for everyone afterwards, if that's right, Ash. Yep, um, I have a bunch of resources to, to dish out, so that'll be one. Um, but you can also go on to the Farm Biosecurity website, um, which is just Farmbiosecurity.com.au, um, I think, um, and it's available yeah. on there. Yeah, and and also it is it is sort of combined with the um, electronic NVD. So when you when you fill out the paper ones, yep, you won't have a health declaration. You've got to get that separately. But when you fill out an NVD online, um, the electronic ones, um, you can actually check the box and actually get a, a sheep health declaration mm -hmm. uh, printed out at the same time. So that's pretty easy there. Um, Jenny mentioned that we do the good air vaccination pretty much every November and mm -hmm. yep we'll be doing that again this year so if you do want to get involved in that please let us know. Drenching pregnant ewes I think I answered that one Steph um, and Ben asked a question could you drench for one year with the same type of drench and then use another type the following year or should we be changing it every time we drench? Well that's a good question and <laughs> I think that's probably where um, Ash mentioned worm boss or paraboss, they're, they're quite useful resources for that. Um, you can use a drench more than once. It do, you, you don't have to change it absolutely every single time. Um, but the more times you use it, the more resistance that you will promote. So um, it's best if you change them fairly regularly. I mean, I guess we probably change about once every year. Yeah. Um, 
depending because you know it just, just depends on what you're using through the year you might use different drenches for different reasons but yeah probably once a year is, is about right yeah. and, and don't sorry. dredge sorry yeah, you're right. and um don't under dredge like mm. always drench to the heaviest animal in your flock they do have a, quite a wide safety range so as long as you use if you under drench you're more likely to get resistance developing to that drench so always just go over but again according to label directions follow the label directions and you can't go wrong um, and you can also use um, I was just going to say, you can also use faecal egg counts um, before and after drench. So if you do an egg count, um, uh, I can't remember how many weeks after you drench. Um, is it about uh, 10, 10, to 14, 10 to 14 days. Okay, yep. Um, and then that will show if you've got any resistance, if there's still worm eggs coming up. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Um, what measures need to be sorry are needed to keep sheep safe and healthy when spraying weeds so that is really important um, again have a look at the label directions of the spray that you're using make sure that sheep are not in the paddock when you're spraying um, and then the, the label directions will say how long before you can put animals or livestock back into that paddock so it might be it might be three weeks it might be three months you know I'm, I'm not you know you need to look at the label directions um, and that's really the way to keep them safe spray, make sure they're out of the paddock, and then make sure they don't go back in the paddock until that nil grazing period has been um, adhered to. Um, yeah. Um, well, thanks for that. That was perfect. We're um, sort of right on time. Um, so what I would like to encourage everyone to do is print out a map of your property, or if you don't have a printer, just draw out a map of your property. Um, draw out all of the fences and infrastructure, dams, everything that you currently have. And then um, I, I'd like you to start sort of getting a plan together or, or getting an idea of what type of infrastructure you think you might like to add, whether it be to split your paddocks up so you can start rotationally grazing. Um, maybe you need to put in a new set of yards or you haven't got yards yet. Maybe you don't even have sheep yet and you're planning to get sheep that you want to set yourself up first. Um, so I, I really encourage you to do that. It's a really useful tool um, and will help set you up going forward. We'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you everyone um, for participating. Thank you for all of your questions. So yeah, that's it. Thanks everyone.